This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, welcoming you to the last Military History Night event podcast for the spring 2013 season. On June 12th, RCMI member Peter Moon spoke to us on his experiences as a child growing up in wartime England. Okay, uh, what you're about to hear are the somewhat jumbled memories of a boy growing up in wartime Britain. Uh, Before I tell you about some of those memories, let me say this. While times were hard in Britain during the Second World War, and they were, I have to remember that they were much harder for children in those European countries that were occupied by the Germans. Britain was attacked, but it was not occupied. So with that acknowledgement, let me begin by setting the time and the scene for you. When the Second World War began in Britain in September 1939, I was five years old. When the war ended in 1945, I was 11. I was an only child, and when the war started, I was living with my parents in in married quarters at Royal Air Force Station, Halavington, a flying training base in Wiltshire in southwest England. My father was an aircraft mechanic. He joined the RAF as an aircraft apprentice at the age of 15, and he retired after the war at the age of 55, after 40 years of service. Uh, Within a few weeks of war being declared, we had to vacate our married quarter, and we moved into rented accommodation in in a village about five miles from the Air Force base. But it was in those first few weeks before we moved from the base that I have my oldest memory of life as a child in wartime Britain. I was playing with a small group of children near an electric transmission pylon. As soon as war was declared, an armed guard was placed on the pylon. He was an airman armed with a Lee Enfield bolt-action rifle with a bayonet attached to it. We kids thought that was pretty exciting. For us, it meant we really were at war. Uh, One day, the guard told us, uh, he kept telling us, move away from the base of the pylon. We ignored him. We were kids. Suddenly, He aimed his rifle at us, worked the bolt, and shouted that if we didn't move away, he was going to shoot us. Well, I ran home as fast as I could with tears flowing to tell my mother what had happened. When my father came home, he told me I wasn't to worry about it. The guard only wanted us to move, and in any case, our airmen wouldn't kill anyone on our side. It's amazing when you think about it. That incident happened more than 70 years ago, and I still remember it. Uh, Soon afterwards, we were forced to move out of our married quarter to rent an accommodation in a village near the base. Uh, A few months later, I was in the playground of a school in that village when the Germans attacked RAF Halavington. It was a devastating air raid. It damaged not only aircraft, buildings, and aircraft hangars, but seven airmen were killed, and another six were badly wounded. Uh, An enemy fighter... uh, An enemy fighter escorting the German bombers on that attack suddenly appeared flying very low over the village. I remember seeing the black German cross on the left side of its fuselage as it banked in and came towards us. I was tremendously excited. I was seeing the hated enemy for the first time. As it flew in our direction, the German pilot, for whatever reason, let fly a very short burst of machine gun fire. All the children in the playground ran for cover. And for years, I remember running away from that plane, racing as fast as I could, the whole length of a huge, long playground to take cover in the boys' washroom. Like the incident with the RAF sentry pointing his rifle at me, I've never forgotten that incident with a German fighter aircraft, or of what seemed like a never-ending dash to the shelter of that washroom at the end of the playground. About 25 years ago, During a visit to England, I drove to that village to take a look at it in my old school. I picked up a hitchhiker on the outskirts, and it quickly became apparent, amazingly, that although we did not remember each other, we had to have been in the same class. And he too remembered the incident with a strafing German fighter. He said there were a couple of bullet marks still clearly visible on the school wall. Well, it was with mounting excitement, for me at least, that we arrived at the school and walked to the playground where he pointed out the bullet marks. But what a shock I had. That long, long playground of my memory wasn't huge at all. In fact, it was quite small, about the size of this room. At least the two bullet marks were there, so my memory of that incident wasn't completely wrong. And that's the problem with trying to remember or recall memories of so long ago. 
So it is with that caveat that I stand here this evening to tell you about some of my memories as a child of the Second World War in Britain. The Second World War was a time of doing without for everyone in Britain, adults and children. We had to do without all the clothes, food, amenities, and toys that we take for granted today. From the beginning of the war until the end, almost six years later, just about everything was in short supply. And what was available was invariably rationed, strictly but usually fairly. Everything you can think of was in short supply. It was a time of continual austerity. Even coal, electricity, and heating gas were rationed. Gasoline, of course, for the average citizen was unobtainable, uh, except on the black market with its attendant risk of prosecution. I've hardly grown since I was 12, uh, and it was a nightmare for my mother to get new clothes and shoes for me as I quickly outgrew what I had. It meant not only finding bigger sized clothes and shoes, and that was difficult enough, but she had to accumulate the precious clo clothing coupons required to get them. Materials and fabrics were needed for the armed forces and emergency services. To help them, the civilian population had to do without. All boys, for example, to save our material, had to wear short trousers until they were 11 years old. I have a wartime photograph of me wearing my first set of long trousers, standing next to my proud mother. I was about to enter high school for the first time, and I had my first pair of long trousers. But that photograph was taken to be mailed to my father, who by then had disappeared somewhere in the Far East with the RAF. We knew he was alive, but we didn't know where he was or what he was doing. We got occasional brief letters from him, with words often cut out or blacked out of them by the wartime censor. For many young boys like me, the war years were years when most of the men we knew disappeared into uniform. It meant that I lived in a largely female world, usually surrounded by young women like my mother, who suddenly became a sing some became single mothers, or if they weren't mothers, who were required to do essential war work of some kind. The only civilian men around were usually either elderly or unfit for war service. Military uniforms were everywhere. Children like me were fascinated by the shoulder flashes, showing a soldier, a sailor, or airman had reached Britain from Canada, France, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, and all kinds of other countries. U.S. troops arrived later in the war, and we were intrigued by them, our only knowledge of Americans being what we had learned from Hollywood movies. To us, they're exotic creatures, and I remember their friendliness and their generosity with candies and chewing gum. Chewing gum was a novelty for us. I was too young to be exposed to or to understand the popular saying of the time about the U.S. troops, quote, they're overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Uh, but I do remember a lot of jealous remarks about their comparatively high pay and easy access to food and consumer goods that the people of Britain could not get and had not seen in many cases for a long, long time. I remember people felt kinder to Canadian troops compared to the Americans, but the, general, the genuine generosity of the Americans won them a lot of friends. As a result of my father's pre-war service with the RAF and his many postings during the war, I finished up going to eight schools by the time I was 11. My mother tried to follow my father wherever he was posted to in England or Scotland, but she finally gave up because accommodation was so scarce and hard to get. I have a vivid memory of watching a bombing raid by the Germans in 1941. The RAF had virtually taken over the seaside resort of Morecambe as a training facility, and I was living with my parents in a boarding house in Morecambe. The Germans repeatedly bombed Barrow and Furness, an important shipbuilding city across the bay from Morecambe. I remember standing on the seafront in the dark, holding my father's hand, he was in uniform, while we watched the searchlights trying to find the German bombers. We could hear the explosions and see huge fires burning. Many people died in those raids. Many more were left homeless and many suffered serious injuries. My mother and I lived in various places in Scotland and in the northeast of England before settling in Wolverhampton, a small industrial city near Birmingham. My father was able to visit us briefly on a very few occasions before he was posted overseas. There was no telephone, no email or internet in those days. Our only means of communication was through precious but heavily censored letters 
that gave you very little information. I was subjected to bombing when I lived in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, where I remember huddling under staircases and under tables during air raids. I often huddled in what was called a Morrison shelter. It was a cage-like contraption specially designed for small children. I was also bombed in Wolverhampton, but my mother and I were lucky. The houses we lived in were never hit. The Germans bombed major industrial centres in the Midlands, which are part of central England, cities such as Birmingham and Coventry, both of which were hit regularly and heavily. The Germans often flew over Wolverhampton on their return flights from those raids, or targets, and that meant we had to take shelter when the air raid sirens blew their wailing warnings. In Wolverhampton, my mother and I often slept in what was called an Anderson shelter. An Anderson shelter was a hole dug in the, the back garden with curved sheets of corrugated steel placed over it as a protective roof, and the roof was covered with earth. We slept in bunks, and it was often wet or damp, and quite often very cold at night. I actually loved it when the Germans flew over, because it was close to a horse racing track where anti-aircraft batteries fired guns and rockets at the German planes while searchlights swept the sky looking for them. I used to look out of the tiny doorway of the Anderson shelter, hoping to see a German bomber get hit. That never happened, but it was noisy and exciting, and despite my mother's best efforts, I didn't get much sleep on those frequent occasions. Trying to keep awake the next morning in school was often quite difficult. Few people got much sleep during those air raids. Occasionally, the Germans dropped bombs on Wolverhampton, and all the boys I knew, as well as me, went looking for bomb damage the next day and for what was left of any incendiary bombs that might have been dropped until we were warned not to pick them up. Uh, we used to collect the tail fins of the burned out uh, incendiary bombs as souvenirs. At least we did until the wartime propaganda told us that the dastardly Germans were booby trapping some of the incendiary bombs and people who picked them up could trigger an explosion and lose a hand or worse. Of course it wasn't true. But we believed almost everything our wartime propagandists told us. They taught us very successfully to hate the enemy. I was lucky. I escaped the Blitz. The Blitz was the name given to the concentrated eight-month bombing campaign mounted against London and 15 other major cities in 1940 and 1941. London was bombed for 57 consecutive nights, as well as on many more additional nights. More than one million houses in London were destroyed or damaged, and more than 40,000 civilians were killed during the Blitz, almost half of them in London. Because there was no television or internet back then, our only sources of information were the heavily censored newspapers, which were only a few pages thick, because paper was heavily rationed. Everyone listened to the newscasts on the single radio channel offered by the British Broadcasting Corporation. And everyone talked about the newsreels we saw when we went to the movies, which most of us did at least once a week. We called the movies the pictures. And we always called the radio the wireless. I can remember people gathering around to listen to Winston Churchill's historic radio broadcasts. Quote, Churchill is speaking tonight, people would say. And everybody who could do so listened to him. I was always allowed to stay up late to hear him speak. He was a popular and much admired war leader. And I couldn't understand why the electric threw him out of the office in the first election after the war. But then, I was only a youngster at the time. I remember uh, there were propaganda posters everywhere. We were urged to, quote, dig for victory. That meant grow our own vegetables. And anyone who, get, who could did, because they were a valuable source of food. We even had vegetable gardens at the schools I attended. We were told, quote, don't be a squanderbug. A cartoon squanderbug told us not to waste money which could be donated to the war effort by buying war bombs or contributing to the building of a Spitfire fighter plane or a tank, and not to waste precious consumer goods. I remember the squanderbug posters were everywhere, and the truth is we largely followed his advice. I remember going to great lengths to collect newspaper and cardboard for the war effort. I proudly wore a badge that designated me a general in the Squanderbug Army for my war collection efforts. We were constantly exhorted to do our bit to win the war, adults and children. And for the most part, I think most of us did. My mother certainly followed the advice of the quote, make do and men posters. 
She was always knitting and constantly repairing our few clothes to make them last longer. And in truth, because of shortages, she had a little choice about that. We were told to use only five inches of water when we took our weekly baths. Yes, weekly baths. To help save energy. And soap, of course, was also rationed. In fact, it was often hard to get. And best of all, we ate carrots. Did we ever eat carrots? Quote, carrots keep you healthy and help you see in the blackout, said the posters. We were told carrots were the secret behind the success of the Aria fighter pilots. The pilots, we were told, you know, we really believed it. <laughs> he ate prodigious amounts of carrots so they could see in the dark and shoot down German bombers. The newspapers were full of interviews with pilots who attributed their nighttime successes to their carrot consumption. The propaganda machine promoted that blatant lie because the secret to the pilot's success was really radar, which for most of the war was a very big secret. And I remember the blackout. We had to avoid giving any help to the German night bombers, and that meant ensuring that no light came from our homes at night. Everyone had thick, dark curtains that blocked out every bit of light. The blackout meant no street lighting, very heavily dimmed vehicle lights, and no lights in store windows. In fact, basically, no lights. A light anywhere could bring a sharp and familiar put out that light uh, from a policeman or an air raid precautions warden. People who didn't comply could get fined, and they did get fined. The blackout was serious business, and people took it seriously, even kids. Stumbling around the dark was part of our contribution to the war effort. Uh, so that they could be seen in the dark, sidewalk curbs were painted white. Trees and lampposts had white rings around them, and the fronts and backs of vehicles had white lines painted on them. The blackout was so successful it became a hazard. I remember that walking anywhere at night was very difficult because it was so dark. You walked very carefully. In the first six months of the war, more than 4,000 people died on Britain's roads, and almost 3,000 of them were pedestrians many of them children. People were knocked down by vehicles, fell down holes, and drowned when they fell into water in the dark. Very few people had flashlights. We called them torches. And if they did, the batteries for them were very hard to get. They were nowhere near as bright as flashlights are today, and the batteries did not last for very long. We had few toys, and we had to use our imaginations when we played. We didn't play cowboys and Indians. We played us against the Germans. Uh, we died in our games the way people did in the movies, quickly and dramatically. Nobody got lingering or maiming wounds in our games or in the movies. But it was always a bit of a problem getting enough boys to be the Germans, because they always lost in our war games. And as a result, the smaller boys usually got forced into being the German enemy. Our guns were pieces of wood, and our hand grenades were simple stones. Everyone went to the movies. They were one of the few excitements and moments of magic and color in a dreary world of constant war, suffering, and shortages. Uh, the programs consisted of a feature movie, a newsreel, and what was called a B-movie, or a shorter second feature film. The programs usually changed twice a week. The newsreels were watched eagerly and with great anticipation, because remember, we had no television in those days. I remember in April 1945 seeing the first newsreel, showing the first of the Allied liberations of the concentration camps. I was horrified by what I saw on the screen. I stepped out into the theatre lobby while the terrible scenes of the dead and dying were being shown. I was not alone. Other people did what I did. Then I decided I had to watch it. So I sat through the whole program again until the newsreel repeated itself. What I saw in that first newsreel made a huge impression on me as a youngster, and I have never forgotten it. When the war was over, I talked with my Uncle Harry, one of my father's brothers, about the concentration camps. Harry was one of my boyhood heroes. He survived Dunkirk as a young soldier of 17. He won a military medal for bravery in the field in the Netherlands and went into Belsen concentration camp on the second day of its liberation. The memories of Dunkirk and Belsen stayed with him until he died, but Belsen was the most powerful. He said he could never forget the appalling sights and sickening smells and the terrible urges he had to kill every German in his sight while he was in the camp. 
Looking back with what we now know about post-traumatic stress, I don't think he ever recovered from his experiences as a young soldier. When I was preparing this talk, oh sorry, uh, Harry died a, a long time ago, but I have his military medal and the diary he kept when he fought in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. I read it occasionally, and I always find it an emotional experience. When I was preparing this talk, I spent a couple of days jotting down notes about things I remembered. Here, in no particular order, are some of them. I remember visiting London with my mother towards the end of the war, and being tremendously excited when I heard and saw a doodlebug, one of Hitler's V-rockets. The V-rockets, V-1s and V-2s, were among Hitler's so-called vengeance weapons. The British called them doodlebugs, buzz bombs, and flying bombs. Unlike the air raids, the rockets arrived too quickly for an air raid warning to sound and give people time to get take shelter. The first ones landed in London in June 1944, just after D-Day, and the last one fell in March 1945, just before the end of the war in Europe. I didn't realise until years later how terrible the V-rockets were, how many people they killed in London, and how much they demoralised and almost broke the spirit of Londoners who thought that by that time in the war, bombings for them were a thing of the past. The little bug I saw that day in London suddenly appeared flying low before its noisy engine cut out, and it plunged from the sky, out of sight behind some buildings. There was a tremendous explosion, the ground shook under me, and then there was fast-rising black clouds of smoke. I was a young boy, and I'd finally seen something I'd read about in the newspapers. I was the only boy in my school to see one, because Wolverhampton was not targeted by them. It made me something of a celebrity for a while at school. The V-rockets hit not only London, but Southampton, Portsmouth, and Manchester. They killed more than 6,000 people, including children, and injured almost 18,000 people, as well as destroying thousands of homes. In total, the death rate across Britain from German air raids and rocket attacks during the war was 61,000 people killed. I remember seeing German and Italian prisoners of war as the war progressed. They usually worked in the fields in food production or on the sites of bomb buildings. They were a common sight. Italy switched sides in 1943 and we used to talk to the Italian prisoners. At the end they did not have armed guards and they were so friendly, looked so inoffensive and so obviously homesick that we invariably felt very sorry for them. The Germans always had armed guards and we hated them. We never smiled at them and we never talked with them even though they tried to talk to us. Both the Germans and the Italians wore big round patches on their uniforms to make them stand out. The soldiers guarding them told us the Germans always had a big central patch on the back of their uniforms so they could aim at it if they tried to escape. For much of the war we had double daylight saving time to save on energy and allow people to get around before it got dark and the blackout went into effect. I can remember watching the skies fill with planes in the evenings towards the end of the war as aircraft gathered in massive streams for the 1,000 bomber raids on Germany. We had no pity or compassion for the people who were going to be at, on the receiving end of those massive raids. Military aircraft were constantly in the sky throughout the war. Any self-respecting boy could identify all the Allied aircraft. I remember watching dogfights during the Battle of Britain. We saw the contrails high in the sky. The pilots were my big heroes. For us, the fighter pilots were heroic, and we had no knowledge of the terrible air crew death rates and losses, particularly among the bomber crews. Air crew and bombers were the nice guys who used to give me candy, prized chocolate bars and butterscotch issued to them when they went flying. Candies, we call them sweets, were strictly rationed and sparsely given out throughout the war, as was sugar. For that reason alone, we were a generation of kids who had few cavities. As a child, I was allowed to buy no more than 12 ounces of candy a week. In fact, the strict rationing of most foods made us very healthy children, because we didn't overeat, and what we were able to get to eat was, by and large, healthy food. There were, there was, there were no such things as junk food or soft drinks full of sugar. There was no gasoline for private vehicles. We walked everywhere. And when we had to, we used public transport. There were very, very few overweight people or kids in Britain during the war. Rationing of many foodstuffs continued long after the end of the war. I did my compulsory national service in the Royal Air Force from 1952 to 1954. 
And when I went home on weekend passes, my mother always implored me to remember to bring with me the food ration coupons I got with my leave passes. Sugar and candy stayed rationed until 1953. Food rationing of all kinds did not finally end until 1954. The buses and streetcars during the war were always full, and so were the trains. As a boy, I was expected to give up my seat for an adult, particularly to women and the elderly. Kids don't do that today, do they? We raised rabbits for food, and I remember being saddened whenever we used to eat one of the lovable bunnies I'd spent so much time feeding. But rabbit meat was a treat. I left killing them to my mother. I remember eating when it was available whale meat and horse meat, which were not rationed. I didn't like the whale meat, and my mother finally said it wasn't, re it wasn't right to eat horses. I was sorry about that because horses tasted a lot like cows to me. I was a youngster with a hearty appetite. We ate lots of vegetables because they were not rationed, and we grew a lot of our own in the garden. Children got free milk, cod liver oil, and orange juice. I remember my mother forced me to swallow a teaspoon of cod liver oil every day. It tasted awful, and I hated it. Uh, we got free milk at school and free lunches through a wartime feeding operation called British Restaurants. Eggs were heavily rationed. They were a rarity. We got powdered eggs instead. We also ate a lot of powdered potatoes. The important thing was that we didn't go hungry, and we ate a generally healthy diet, a far cry from what Britain, uh, children in Britain eat today. They are now the most obese of all children in Europe. I was never evacuated to escape the German bombing raids, but many children I knew were. They had to leave their homes in heavily bombed areas and live with foster parents in cities and towns and villages far from their homes. Some of them not at home for years. In all, 1.6 million children, 1.6 million children were evacuated under the official evacuation schemes. Many were treated with great kindness. Uh, others were exploited, sexually assaulted, physically abused, and treated with great unkindness. It was all in the luck of the draw. Remember, all of this took time, took place at a time when the only means of communication for most people was by writing letters. That was a hard thing for a young child to do. Very few people had telephones. For much of the war, I carried a gas mask in a cardboard box with a simple carrying strap made of string. Uh, we used to do gas mask drills on a regular basis at school, and similarly, we did regular air raid shelter drills. I had a national identity card issued to me, and I was supposed to carry it at all times, but I rarely did, and I was never asked to produce it. I also had ration books with coupons for food and clothing, but my mother never let me carry them in case I lost them. For her, they were too precious to risk me doing them. The war placed a heavy load on my mother. She had to care for me. I was a fast-growing youngster in a time of severe shortages and difficulties in getting just about anything. And she spent a significant part of her time, six days a week, lining up in what the British called queues. Uh, to go from store to store to find food and other necessities. There were no supermarkets in those days. She had little money, her family was far away from much of the war in the north of England and Scotland, and she didn't know where her husband was or what he was doing. On June 6, 1944, my friends and I were all astonished to see the sky full of Allied aircraft. The aircraft had three white stripes on the wings that we had never seen before. We talked excitedly about it when we got to school. We soon found out the reason. June 6 was D-Day. The Allies had landed in France, and the three stripes identified the liberating Allied air forces. Well, we all went nuts with excitement, and the head teacher, we called her headmistress in those days, finally sent us all home. Uh, I told you about my earliest memory of the Second World War, the sentry pointing his rifle and saying he was going to shoot me. One of my last memories is a victory in Europe day. Everyone called it VE Day. It was the end of the war in Europe, and it was celebrated on May 8, 1945. It was a magical experience for a youngster who could not remember seeing artificial lights on everywhere, in houses and store windows, in buses or the full headlights of motor vehicles. That night, nobody shouted, at, put out that light. The blackout was gone forever. For much of the war years, one of the most popular, inspiring songs was called When the Lights Go On Again All Over the World. Well, on that wonderful evening of Victory in Europe Day, the lights did indeed go back on again. 
I was almost 11 years old, and my mother and I went that historic evening to downtown Wolverhampton, where there was a huge bonfire and thousands of people singing and dancing and celebrating, and the main square seemed to me to be ablaze with artificial light. Those lights dazzled me, and I've never forgotten them or that night. When we got home, I leaned out of my bedroom window and gazed down the street and looked with wonder at the movie theatre with its brightly lit red neon sign saying, Odeon. The next day, most of the public lights and the store lights were all out again. And so was the Odeon movie theatre sign. The war was over, but we had to save energy. My mother and I had to wait until shortly after VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day, on August 14, 1945, to find out that my father was on a tiny group of atoll islands in the Indian Ocean. They were called the Kokokili Islands, and they were midway between what was then Ceylon, present-day Sri Lanka, and Australia. The RAF had landed on them from warships in 1944 and quickly set up a vital airstrip that allowed Allied aircraft to fly for the first time during the war between Ceylon and Australia. I remember my father coming home a year after the war ended, and he was someone I really didn't know that well. My mother had been the head of our two-person household for several years, and he was a stranger to me. It took a long time for us to forge a meaningful relationship. A lot of my friends had similar experiences with their fathers. A lot of women found it difficult to relinquish their, posi to relinquish their position as head of the household uh, to a man they had not seen for years while they struggled to keep things running at home. Many of the men came back home changed forever by what they had seen and done while they were away. As a child, along with millions of other British children, I had survived the greatest war in history. But in Britain's armed forces, and the figures I'm gonna quote are for the British forces alone, they do not include allied losses. In Britain's armed forces, more than 264,000 men that's more than a quarter of a million men, and more than 600 women were killed. And of those who died, 3,500 were under 18 years of age. There were 18 boys who were in the armed forces who were only 14 years old. In the merchant navy and the fishing fleets, 30,000 men were killed, and 1,200 members of the elderly home guard died on duty. On the home front in Britain, a total of 61,000 civilians were killed by enemy action. Of those 61,000 civilians, almost 8,000 were children under the age of 16. Those 8,000 children accounted for approximately one death in eight. Another 8,000 children under 16 were seriously wounded by enemy bombing. Thousands, thousands of children were left to grow up without a father or a mother. Thousands more lost grandparents, brothers, sisters, and other relatives and friends whose loss would diminish their lives forever. I was one of the lucky ones. I lost no one close to me. I also think I'm lucky because I have, 70 years later, so many memories of a very difficult but truly inspiring time in British history. And so with that thought, thank you for letting me share some of these jumbled childhood memories with you this evening. I hope some of them were of interest to you. is mouthing to me. Any questions? Are there any questions? <laughs> Anybody has a question? Please start now. There you go. Yes. Not a question as much as a comment, perhaps. Uh, coincidentally, oh yes, just in case you can't hear me. Uh, coincidentally, I've just been reading a wonderful book called Millions Like Us which is accounts of women lives during the Second War in Britain. And uh, much of what you have talked about tonight parallels closely with the experiences. This includes also women, of course, in the forces and so on. But uh, I commend that book to any of you who are interested in such things. Millions like us, I can't, of course I can't remember the author. Anyway, thank you very much for this this evening. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. If this is a question about music, I don't really answer. Oh, <laughs> darn. Well, in our, uh, in our RCMI show in October, we're doing a selection called Songs That Won the War. Yes. 
And uh, in the wireless, can you remember any of the songs that you heard uh, when you could hear the radio? Oh, yes, I do. I mean, you know, the, Vera. Uh, 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 Vera Lynn, of course, the Force of Sweetheart, who's still alive, amazingly. Uh, and I can get, I can get, I can send you by email a whole bunch of those songs, and they're my era. I mean, I was a kid, and even when I went into the Royal Air Force to do my national service, they, those songs were still being sung. Uh, and compared with music today, they just have a melody and a tune and some words. I like them. Me too. Come to the show in yes. October because we have some very interesting things happening. Yes. I equally was um, standing away during the war as an evacuee corner. And um, I remember very, very, uh, very, very much all the um, Americans that came in. And we loved them. We thought they were gorgeous. Um, but the one thing we had to do was sing songs. And we had to act and do shows with them. And the mothers who had the pavilion on Penz in Penzance um, occupied that. And we actually did shows. And one of the American forces came up and said to the leaders, would they do it for us just on our own? And we did. And I thought they were wonderful because they used to throw sweets up to us. Yes, that's right. so, so our men was a great, but we lost our house in London during the war. It was incendiary bombs and mm -hmm. the whole house went. So that's why we were taken to Cornwall. And were you lucky? The people that you stayed with, did they treat you well? Absolutely. Well, you were lucky, yes. Yes, we had a wonderful time. And did you stay in touch with them? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you for your talk. It was the most interesting. <clears throat> Peter, uh, English school ch children have always had uh, a fairly large sports program and do an awful lot of hiking and moving around in the school year. Uh, was that curtailed in the Second World War? No, well, no, not, not in my personal experience. Uh, during the war, we did uh, we went to school five and a half days a week. So usually Wednesday afternoon was a compulsory sports afternoon, and you did classroom work on a Saturday. Uh, and um, I've, I've never, I hate to say this about Canada, but I, I've never liked sport in North America. It's too cutthroat for me. We played the game and it was, it was a fun. Um, we played inter-house games, so you were, uh, I belonged to a house. We had to field four teams. The best team, the top-notch guys, the soccer players, the cricket players, they got two points if they won. But the, lovely, you know, the, the real terrible players in the fourth team, if they won, they got two points for the house too. And I like that idea. Similarly, when I went in the RAF, it was a five and a half day work week. Every Wednesday afternoon was compulsory sports, and we had to go in uniform on Saturday until noon to work. Uh, then I joined the union when I was at the Global Mail, 35 hours a ton of time. <laughs> <laughs> system up to a point. 
Well, I would just second what was just said about the rationing in Canada, and I was sort of seven or eight years old during the war, and I remember rationing for all types of food, rationing for gasoline, or no cars even allowed. Mm -hmm. So, and we practiced air raids in the public school I went to, and uh, many other things. My mother uh, took aluminum pots and submitted them to the government mm -hmm. to make ships and airplanes, mm -hmm. and also filled ditty bags that went to the sailors with food, and with uh, clothing, so it was a very active program here. I think well. you got more food than I did because you're three inches taller than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Probably did. We had a garden in the backyard. That's right. <laughs> we were not a sugar family, and so my parents would trade off their sugar coupons for tea. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When uh, when we got the ration coupons when we went on leave, <clears throat> we we'd sit in a group and we'd trade because we'd know what our mothers <laughs> wanted to have. And, and uh, my sister was fond of butter, and I can remember trading sugar for butter, and I'd come home with all these butter coupons. And my mother told me the next time I came, I was to come with sugar and favor her instead of my sister. <laughs> that lady is a perfect segue for what I wanted to say about rationing, too, because you were talking about food, and I well remember cod liver oil and cabbage. Yes, yes. It was always boiled. Yeah. <laughs> Orange juice. But coming to um, butter, um, I went up um, to Edinburgh to visit some relatives, and they lost me. They couldn't find me anywhere. And they had a lovely big dining room table with a great big snowy white tablecloth, and they eventually found me, and I was underneath eating the complete ration supply of butter. <laughs> Just add two quick things. One, the gentleman about the music. Um, my mother is now in the late stages of Alzheimer's. She's 19 and she's in a home in England. But I'll tell you the thing that gives me the most joy, and her obviously, is when somebody comes in to sing songs and she still knows all the words. She, there's so many other things she can't communicate on, but she can sing all those war songs, which is amazing to me. The question I have for you, please, is that there are many events, I know you've been an investigative reporter and you've done all sorts of different things, many events that are kept under wraps for many years and only after enough time has passed are we allowed to know what really went on. For example, the Bletchley Codes, I think would be a good example. Is there anything that you would really like to know what was the truth behind based on your past experiences? And well, some of the stuff starting to come out. The, the British have enacted very, um, in the last five or six years, they've really enacted very strong freedom of information laws, much stronger than they are in Canada. Uh, and it destroys the image of the British, because in fact they killed German prisoners of war in, in, in London. Uh, in 1972, I went to Germany and I interviewed the only surviving U boat captain of a U boat that came out the St. Lawrence River during the Second World War. And one of the things he told me was that he was taken to this particular uh, big house in London and he was badly beaten by the British. And he said they put a pistol in my mouth and they played Russian roulette with me. And he said the silly thing was as, as, the, as the chamber went around, I could see there were no bullets in it. But he said they almost stuck some of my teeth out. Um, uh, and he actually he came to Canada and did, he was a prisoner of war here. And when I interviewed him, he was the number two man in the uh, German Navy. Uh, he was a rear admiral. Uh, and, and some terrible things have come out about the, the way the British treated German prisoners of war. All secrets until uh, in the last 10 years. It's the same way with all the terrible stuff that's coming about, but about the way we treated the people in Kenya during the Mau Mau Trace. Less than 30 white settlers were killed, and we killed something like 12,000 Kikuyu, many of them tortured to death. So the British um, have got a lot of things to come out. To their great credit, they're starting to come out if you know where to go and find it. I admire them for the fact they are finally making these records public. Yeah. Uh, Peter, your, your comments... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hiding in the back. Yes, yes. No, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I, I was born in London. I grew up in London in, in, in the 60s. And it was interesting. Most of our teachers uh, were obviously kids at that time, during the war, they were now our teachers. And when you were talking about the sort of games you're playing, it's interesting as a schoolboy in England, living in both London and, and rural Oxfordshire, 
those were the same games we played. Mm -hmm. And I have memories of uh, you know, being in South London as a boy and then going out to Docklands. Of course, Docklands in the 60s was still bombed out. There was a room. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we used to do, even back then, was look for ruined German mm -hmm. planes. We were always looking for stuff from the war yeah. and looking for bombs. Mm -hmm. So when you sort of mentioned that, I said, oh my God, you know, 20, 20 years later, I was doing the same thing. Yeah. We also used our imaginations when we played. I mean, you had to. Uh, to, to don't have none of that. Everybody's electronic imagination now. And we also looked at, looked at people when we walked. We were, we were looking at the telephones. Uh, Peter, uh, have you ever seen the movie Empire of the Sun by Spielberg? Yes. Um, the interesting thing there, of course, is Spielberg has been famous for having a boy's point of view on lots of subjects, E.T. and all this kind of stuff. To your knowledge, is there any other films or documentaries or books or literature that cover a child's point of view in war? Yeah, there was a movie. I'm trying to think of it. Open Glory. Open Glory. Yes, Open Glory. It's a wonderful yeah. film. And it's got someone with a barrage balloon. Yeah. That's right. And, and, and it's a terrific film, if you can see. It came out about, what, 10, 12 years ago? And it shows the impact of the, the bombing on the London family and the rationing and that kind of thing. And that was very, and very true to what I think real life was at the time. You had a touch of it during um, On Which We Serve, where the two petty yeah. officers come home on leave, yeah. and one was going to stay over with his maid at the house, and they round the corner, and the whole house was yeah. demolished. And it was a very riveting scene, yeah. but you didn't sort of catch the, you know, the civilian point of view. It was from a military point of view, that film. But any other things that come out of something? Well, there are movies, I mean, yeah, I, I can't think, like, like I'm going to send the, the songs to Guido, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find something for you on that, because there is some amazing stuff. Uh, the, the other thing that really strikes me is that how naive we, we were, adults and children, because that we certainly didn't have the avenues of information that we've got today. Uh, we, we just, tr we believed government, uh, you believed everything, we were very uh, patriotic, no question about that. But uh, you just didn't know what was really going on. And, but for example, one of the things, even today, I can't find out how many people died as a result of falling at Ak Uh Very few planes, or German planes, were shot down by anti-aircraft fire. But it, it was, the, 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 the studies show in the, 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 the files are coming out, the War Office thought it was very important for the morale of the British that we shoot at German aircraft. Uh, but that stuff all went up and came down. <laughs> and people were killed by it, no question about it. And a lot of damage was done by it when it fell. But it was important to keep people's morale up. Peter, um, just to say, um, I was evacuated to um, Bear Green in Dorking. Yes. It's all about Britain. And uh, my father got a little bit worried. My, my family's from Ireland. So I went to Ireland, and a neutral country, and I used to spend hours walking on the beach and it was wonderful, I had the beach to myself. When I went to Brighton, when I came back at different times from Ireland to, to London, um, it was quite funny because I used to go down to Brighton and there would be a small spit of sand, a sandwich between barbed wire right. and, and you used to feel yeah. funny the English. <laughs> well, they, they were like crowding together, we were yeah. miles of beach and um, that was my experience there. And, um, I was in a care home, I mean, some of my work took me into a care home, and one of the things that was said here tonight is that um, songs that animate people who are in care homes, and I can tell you there was uh, children that came with origami for the uh, residents, and they were interested but not excited, but on the old Joanna, excuse me, <laughs> and they would tinkle out or roll out the barrel, and right. everybody was tense alive. And it seemed like that's the spark that brought them together and animated them. So that's a few things I want to share. Well, the, the other thing was during the war, for example, and it was part of life before the war and for a while afterwards, no TV. So people used to ha come, come together in the evenings and made their own entertainment. Somebody would sing, somebody would do some magic, somebody would play the spoons. And there were always, always pianos, people could play the piano. Might be out of tune, but you could bang out a tune and that, that people could sing to. And it did keep spirits up, there's no question about it. Yeah, oh, thank you. Churchill said that the uh, 
truth was so precious that it must be surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. That's right. There is a book by that title that deals with this subject. Uh, I don't remember who the author is, but the title is uh, A Bodyguard of yes. Lies. If anyone's interested, they can look it up. And the first casualty of war is the truth. The truth. <laughs> That's right. Look, we have a question. Oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> This isn't a question, it's just a comment, because I too was a child in England during the war, and actually Peter and I lived about 12 miles from each other. We didn't know each well, other. we didn't know each other then. It was very really interesting. But my memories were a bit unique. My mother was a Canadian who had married an Englishman and went to live in England in 1932. And the consequences of that was my mother would often entertain. We lived in Cornwall, by the way, in uh, Portreath, which I visited just a month ago for the first time again. And my mother used to have teas, and she would invite all the Canadian soldiers and airmen, well, the airmen, who were at local bases to come and have tea with her. And she said she never saw them a second time. They always died, because they were up there in the Battle of Britain and never made it back or crashed. The second memory I have is on VE Day. I got my first orange. Mm -hmm. We'd never seen an orange. Yeah. And the town was handing out oranges. My mother said, take your little brother down and go get an orange. And I was seven. He was five. We headed out, and I was so excited about these <laughs> oranges that I came roaring home to my mother. And I said, look, Mommy, Mommy, I've got two oranges. She said, darling, where's your little brother? <laughs> <laughs> and the third memory is something quite unique. Because we were Canadian, at the end of the war, right at the end of the war in November, we were sent back to Canada, even though my mother didn't want to leave because my father was posted at that time to Salon. And we were told we had to leave. Anybody who had a passport to any other country and could be sent back to that country, there was more food, we were sent away. And so we were told about this rather quickly. My mother was told. She sold off everything. And we were going to a little school in, in uh, Wiltshire where the nuns who were supposed to have taken a vow of poverty, but boy, did they like all of our, our belongings. And we sailed on uh, the SS Shanda, November the 11th, 1945. And we didn't see my father again for 18 months after that. But my mother had no choice. And that was an unknown fact about... Uh, uh, those of us who were non british well, we were British, that was the thing. We had British passports, but because of my mother's passport, we were sent back to Canada. And that brother became a major in the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, Air Crew. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Peter. It was a really interesting talk and uh, very interesting. This concludes our webcast series for the spring 2013 RCMI season. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse wishing you a wonderful and relaxing summer and looking forward to seeing everyone again in the fall.